Hi, Billy Grant here. Check out the book Dad at weardad.co.uk and you'll find it really interesting. Some of the stuff that I write about, I actually talk about in this interview with Robert Elms. So check it out, weardad.co.uk. Thank you. Good morning, London. I'm Robert Elms. It's a Monday, so we'll have a listed Londoner. And we're celebrating Brentford Football Club's extraordinary success at getting promoted for the first time in a thousand years to the Premier League. Something like that. So our listed Londoner today is Billy the Bee. No, not that Billy the Bee. This one is Billy Grant. Football fan club organiser, anti-racist campaigner, music biz entrepreneur, and a committed lifelong bee. And Billy will be joining us in about 10 minutes from now, I reckon, because we're about to have this week's listed Londoner. And we thought we would pay tribute to the fact, it's through slightly gritted teeth, it has to be said, that um, a, a, a one of the one of the West London football teams had a, a splendid season that finally saw them getting promoted to the Premier League after more than a thousand years. Um, and that team, of course, is Brentford. And so our listed Londoner today is Billy B, Billy Brentford, Billy Grant, who's been a, a kind of a, a more than active um, Brentford fan for many, many, many moons. He's also been a, a, a music biz entrepreneur. He's been an anti-racist campaigner. And now he's about to be a listed Londoner. Hello, Billy. Hello, Robert. How are you doing? Yeah, very well indeed, but probably not as well as you, because you must be still be basking in the joy of it all. I am. I'm basking. It's funny. I'm basking here, actually, sitting in a, in a rather ro- rather ropey Airbnb in Middlesbrough with me <laughs> with, with my mates. Actually, I came up for the England game, uh, and we're staying up here for a few days, as you do, because uh, as you do as England fans. A few years ago, it's Porto, but this year, unfortunately, you due to COVID, it's it's Middlesbrough. Like you know, <laughs> very but glamorous. A, that's, but it's honestly Middlesbrough. I've been there loads of times with Brentford. It's the first place we put down. We tick it off and buy our train tickets when we come on away days. The people here are wonderful. They're so friendly. They're so, honestly, so many great places to go. We've seen all our old borough friends. They just come out and they're so friendly. Unfortunately, there was a bit of an incident at the stadium. If you check out my Twitter, Billy, the B99, there was a bit of booing, as you know, when they did the knee. But, you know, I turned around to one of the fans and told him I feel uncomfortable. If people don't know, I'm actually a black England fan and I've been to loads of England tournaments. I've been to, like, seven World Cups or something like that, six European Championships. And I turned around to the fans and said, feels uncomfortable and fair play to the England fans. They turned around to this guy and they said, we don't want you here. You must come out. And he actually came out of the stadium and he, he had to move. But that was positive anyway. And it's certainly positive that Brentford, after, you know, I was joking about a thousand years, but it must have felt a bit like it have finally got to, I don't know, the holy land of the Premiership. It was, you know, I mean, if, if, if you said that it was going to happen to me 10, 15 years ago, I'd just say you're absolutely laughing. But for, you know, for you to turn around and or any Brentford fan to say Premier League now, you know, it's still, I mean, for me, it's taken quite a long time to, to, to sink in. You know, I've been supporting them for 40 odd years. I've seen them in the lowest tier. I've seen them play at places like Accrington and Stanley and Wrexham and Scunthorpe. And, you know, listen, I love going to all those places. They're really brilliant places to go to because, you know, I've got an acute knowledge of the whole of the UK, as, as do most of, you know, of Brentford fans who have been to places that people have never been before. But I would have never have thought you would have said find us in the Premier League. And fair play to Matthew Benham, the owner who, he, who had his vision. Years ago, he put his money into it, but also he said, we're going to do it the right way. And he's done it the right way, buying the right players, not actually spending loads and loads of money. And uh, we're proud. And the funny thing about it is, you know, at Wembley as well, you know, Brentford, obviously, nine playoff losses out of nine. I've been to all nine of them. And like real confusion with Brentford fans. And when we won, we came out the stadium and I stood there and I looked at all these Brentford fans. They were just walking around dazed. Right? Like they didn't know what to do. Like, you know, they're just walking around because they're so used to coming out of Wembley, sort of kind of shouting, oh, no, you know, you don't want to go up, Brentford. But they, they were completely confused just walking around the day. And I just thought that really sums up the position we're in. Now, as, as you said, you've, you've been a, a very active um, anti-racist campaigner in terms of football. 
and also a campaigner for kind of fans' rights as well. And and Brentford is, it strikes me, uh, or has been in recent years at least, a splendidly well-run club. Very much still a family club, very much still a, a, a club rooted in its locality out in Hounslow or, you know, Brentford and, and that area. And... Is are you going to be able to maintain that with the pressures of being up there with the big boys? Do you think? I think I think tell you something, and it's a really good point, and it's something that we talk about quite a lot. You know, I I co run Besotted, which is the Brentford blog, the Brentford podcast, and Pride of West dot London, and on that podcast we've done about say eight hundred podcasts, and every sort of every two or three we talk about sort of kind of keeping that integrity, and also fair play to the club. You know, we have good communications with the club. We talk to the owner, we talk to the chairman, we talk to the directors, we talk to everyone, and they talk to us. So they have a lot of respect for us, and we say, look, you know, the important thing is that we want to our club to remain as it is, as much as possible. Yes, you can go up and do the things, but what we don't want to do, we don't want you to be a sort of second-rate Arsenal, a second-rate Chelsea, you know, a second-rate Tottenham, because that's not what we are. We have got to maintain what we're about, and then after we do it, and for me, I'd rather be a sort of a, a smaller, quirkier club, because at the moment, that's why a lot of people come to Brentford. They came to us because we had the terraces at, at Old Griffin Park. You know, we've got loads of Scandinavian people come from abroad because they say, we actually don't want to go to these Premier League places. But some of them are quite identical, but there's something unique about Brentford. And if anyone, I mean, people haven't been there, but you go to any of the pubs around Brentford, no bouncers on the door. As long as, as we say, you've got manners, you come in, you can have a drink. Away fans, we invite them in. You can have a drink with us. Listen, we want to beat you. They want to beat us. We'll have a drink with them. We'll have a chat with them. They'll go to the game. Hopefully we beat them. We come back and we'll have a drink afterwards. And that's why we've kind of got quite good relations up and down the country with different people because we've got this unique atmosphere. And we want to try and make sure we bring that to the Premier League and not trying to, you know, um, just 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 whitewash all of that well, I, and, 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 and make us big. As a QPR fan who's regularly gone away to Brentford, I can concur with all of that. One of my best and oldest friends, Graham Ball, is a lifelong Brentford fan. Yeah. And Graham and I always meet up before games at, at Brentford and, and I go in the pub with him, with all the Brentford kind of hardcore and, you know, my son and wearing his blue and white hoops and it's great there's a bit of banter and there's a bit of fun but it is a a fantastically friendly place to go and watch football and I really hope that you can transfer that to the new stadium and that you can you can sort of keep your soul up there up there with the big boys because you know QPR got it completely wrong when when, when we tried to do it Um, and I think it is a very very tough call yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, we know Bawley, as you call him, Graham Ball, Bawley, big game Bawley, as we call him, because he only, <laughs> sometimes he only used to go to the big games. And I, I think I actually met you when you came down to, to our boozers, which is yeah. the Globe one time, and you came down there, and I think it probably said hello to you as well there, there Robert. And yes, you, you are right. It's something that is difficult, but I think that's something that is maintained by the fans. So when we went up to Division 1, and I think there was a phase where all of a sudden, the, I think the police were saying, right, what we're going to do is we're going to segregate the pubs as they do. So these pubs are going to be, you know, away fans only. These pubs are going to be home fans only. And we got together with the publicans and the independent the supporters association, all that. And we sat down and said, tell you what, we're not having this. So we sat down with the police and we said, look, look, leave it as it is. This is what makes Brentford unique. We'll self-police it ourselves. There would be no problems in these pubs, trust me. And they're a little bit nervous. And then the Fulham came game, which is actually a big game for Brentford. So Brentford Fulham is a re- it's like Liverpool, Everton. It's like it's like a really, really big, quite, can be quite fiery. And then when there's no trouble after that, they say, and then there's no trouble after QPR, they went, I tell you something, fair enough. And there never has been, you know, ever since. So for us, I think a lot of it, just like last night, like I said to you at, at the England game, fan policing, I think is really important. And for people to come out and say what they feel and actually show themselves, because I think a lot of the time, a lot of fans feel things, but they feel a little bit intimidated. So they don't say things. So I think to, to get people to come up and allow them to express themselves, uh, it, that, that will help to maintain sort of the integrity and, 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 and what you're really all about. So we know a lot about your, your <clears throat> the football side of what you do, but you've also been involved very much in the music business, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I've got basically, I, I mean, I was, an, I was an A&R for a, a company, which is a great company, which you probably remember, it's Telstar Records. Yep. And, you know, started off doing all the compilations like the Acid Jazz and the Jungle Mania and, the, you know, loads of dance boom. Really, really successful in doing all those um, compilations. And I loved it. It was lots and lots of fun. Met lots and lots of people. Telstar Records was actually known as the Millwall of the music industry. And the reason why is that they did very well and no one really liked them. So <laughs> this is so typically 90s. So, you know, when Telstar used to go out 
about they go we are telstar no one likes us we don't care like you know so uh, but that was kind of like what the score was about with telstar but they're very successful then i flipped into a and r and i started to a and r with artists with uh craig david sign mystique which is like alicia dixon and and that crew as well you know what connor reeves you know and then i set up my own record label i left telstar set up my own record label called 2.9 which was a uh, an independent record label which fused like Brit, you know r&b hip-hop with the, the the british asian banger scene and honestly we were massive we we just went around the world every every week i was in you know dubai and australia all over the place and uh our artists like jay sean eventually we got him signed to america we got the, the, the u.s number one so billboard number one i think we were one of the first or the first independent record label to have a u.s number one um, in recent times, if not ever, I think it was, because after that, all the other artists came. So it's quite a big feat because there's only two of us, me and my, my boy Rob, Rob Stewart. It's two of us said it, but it was, uh, it was a real journey. And it was interesting trying to, 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 to intermingle football and trying to keep going to Brentford home and away with actually building your own little record label. And it's probably quite lucky it happened at the time. And Terry Butcher was manager and he wasn't very good. And Brentford were at the bottom <laughs> of Division 3. So I didn't go to very many matches when the company was first started. But after that, I've, I've been, before that and after that, I've enjoyed loads and loads of brilliant, brilliant football. Is there still, do you think, uh, I don't know, a, a, a link between kind of football and music culture? Because there always has been, hasn't there? Yeah, I mean, I think there is. To a certain extent, I mean, there, there was a lot, but you know, there was a lot sort of kind of back in the day. I, yeah. I remember actually talking about the link between music culture, and you know, this before the social media era. What I loved about it is that I kind of had this footballing life, this footballing world, where I'd go to. Sorry, well, I had this clubbing world because I was massively into the, you know, the club scene. Probably the same time as what you know, what you were yeah. going to all the, you know, the Africa Centre, you know, going to Special Branch, all these clubs. And I used to love doing that. And then the warehouse scene came, and what I loved is I could go clubbing. I knew everybody inside the club scene and you did it but all of a sudden I came out of that club world and then went to football on Saturday and they were completely separate they just because of social media they just didn't mix yeah. so it's almost like I had sort of two 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 ethos I had sort of two two bodies I had the football the, the football world and the clubbing world and they didn't mix so football I could be with a mate have a good drink and then afterwards I'd go out at night put my clothes on go dancing until four or five o'clock in the morning and that was separate then all of a sudden I remember turning up to a, a, it was a, an acid house party at Wembley Studios, right? And I turned up this acid house party and I, and I was inside there dancing away. And all of a sudden, this guy, Brian, walked in with his wife from, from Brentford. And I was horrified. I was like, <laughs> no, this isn't meant to happen. Brian's here from Brentford, but this is the clubbing world. And he said, all right, Bill, this is great, isn't it? Like, you know, he was sort of dancing away. And from that moment on, Football and, and, and music started to merge. And then, you know, everywhere I went out, you had, a, you know, there's a, a sort of big difference. But I think there is still a bit of a link. But I think it was, I think it was probably a lot stronger back in the day. Um, I've also just had an email from Joanne, who's a fan of mine and a QPR fan and, and a QPR campaigner for Stan Bowles. And, and our two clubs have been sort of working together, or certainly our two sets of fans have been working together to try and yes. kind of help Stan, who, who's played for both clubs, of course. That's that's right. Yeah, Stan Bowles. I remember when Stan Bowles played his very first game for Brentford. You know, I mean, I sound like, I sound like an old man. Oh, Stan well, Bowles. So I, I am too. I watched <laughs> Stan's first game for QBR. Yeah, it was. But he was a he was a great great player. And he, I remember his first game he played. It was Burnley at home. It was a nil all draw. And I remember he had a shot which just skimmed past the post. And uh, it was uh, it was very very close, very very close. But it was nil all in the end. I also remember him scoring a corner, uh, as we call it. We were on the terraces chance. He Stan Bowles curling corner. He curled a corner all the way in. <laughs> against Swindon. I think we won 3-2 as well and I was standing in the corner of the new road at the time. But he was a brilliant player. He was in the midfield with uh, Chris Kamara and Terry Herlock. Um, and we, it's funny because we always say, oh, it's our Brentford's best midfield ever. You know, we, we've just sort of got up to the Premier League and still we, we look back at that sort of third, third tier, third division or whatever it was, uh, midfield as our best midfield ever. But I think it's those, those warm days of when you start first going to football and nothing else really mattered Brentford weren't particularly a great side but whatever they did you really loved it and honoured it and for me you know Stan Bowles was a great player he, he, he lived in uh, I think it was in Braemar Road yep. on the side of the ground so we used to see him all the time he used to drink in the pubs on the corner you know in fact he used to come up to us when we were drinking the new inn which is another pub on the corner, and he used to come up to us, and I think we were showing the um, B, uh, the, the the London uh, standards. Billy, we're, um, gonna to, we're gonna have to stop because yeah. it's ten thirty. Yeah. So oh, we're gonna, sorry, have, to, we're gonna have to take a break. We're gonna go you, to the latest travel update, and then we'll come back and we'll begin those famous fifteen questions. 
The latest travel news for London, I'm Rob Oxley. In Hammersmith, the Hammersmith flyover down to one lane coming into town after a collision as a result of this long delays around West London with uh, queues on the A4 uh, from Chiswick through towards Hammersmith and all around Hammersmith looking very busy. We still have delays uh, in East London on the A13 coming into town after a broken down car earlier on. Whilst in Romford, Chase Cross Road's partly blocked uh, because of a collision at the moment, so buses are on diversion. No service on the Woolwich ferry because of industrial action and the Waterloo and City line uh, no service now until the afternoon it's only running during rush hours uh, but it is running again but only uh, for a couple of hours in the morning and a couple of hours in the evening any updates you can tweet me at BBC Travel Alerts there's more travel just after 11 Play BBC News for London For London's latest news Most of the high speed trains that were taken out of service at the weekend For the latest stories Sadiq Khan says he's living up to his promise to be the greenest and for the had. latest weather for London. Rain for most of the day, temperatures up to... Whenever four. you want it. Play BBC News for London. Ask most smart speakers to play BBC News for London. And you're listening to BBC Radio London here with Robert Elms and with our listed Londoner of the day, who is Billy Grant, um, Brent, Billy, Billy the Bee, so a Brentford fan activist, but also a football anti-racist campaigner, an England supporter and a music biz entrepreneur. And he's about to answer the famous 15 questions. And we're going to begin, as we always do, Billy, with your favourite neighbourhood. Where are you going to pick? I'm picking Stoke Newington, and that's because it's the first place that I lived when I you know, got a proper job. So when I first started working at Telstar, um, I worked at, lived in Stoke Newington and it was cheap enough for me to buy at the time. I was lucky to get it just for the dip and it's still, still a wonderful place. I don't live there anymore. I was taken somewhere else. And uh, and the reason why is it's just it's actually like a proper neighbourhood. It's one of those places where like, you know, I'd go out and the other half would say, you know, where are you going? I said, I'm just going to the pub. He goes, who are we? I said, no one. And you'd sit at the bar. And before you know it, it's like cheers. Somebody else will sit beside you, start chatting, and then somebody else will chat to you. And it was great. And it had loads of little independent shops, you know, Yum Yums, which is uh, the, the, the the restaurant which I used to do lots of parties in, the sausage shop, but also the Yucatan bar, which is this brilliant bar, which was like basically it's a TV bar. And it, they used to basically have about 25 massive satellites outside. And they used to beam games from all over. And they used to show all the Premier League games, all of them. Like, and you had their own screen. And these two sort of kind of really hard Irish guys used to watch it and everyone used to come from all over to the Yucatan to watch the game legal football being came there on a Saturday afternoon brilliant brilliant place Stokey man I still love it so we'll put you down as Stokey as your favourite neighbourhood what about your favourite building it could be a piece of architecture or whatever you choose yeah, listen, I'm going, I'm going through, tell you something, I know so many people have probably said St Pancras Station, which I, which I love, and if I looked at it, you know, you go past it, you think that's actually fantastic. I mean, a lot of people should say, I should be saying New Griffin Park, which is Brentford's new stadium, but to be quite honest with you, I haven't been there enough to say to say that one, but I'll tell you something, what I'm going to actually say, I'll park my mind back to Wembley, right? Actually, I love so the, the old, old Wembley. Wembley. The old Wembley Stadium, you know, I used to bunk into Wembley back in the 80s. I went to all the cup finals, the Wimbledon Cup final, the Everton Cup final, all the cup finals. I found a way to bunk in. So I used to go inside there and I've got a lot of love. This is not acceptable, children, by the way. Let's just not, (laughs) let's not promote that (laughs) behaviour. Yeah, I'm not saying it's right, but when you're young, you do anything to go and see a football match. And that's kind of what I did, you know, so and I'm, you know, at the new Wembley to watch the Euros in a few weeks time. So I'm looking forward to that. In terms of the stadium, as you mentioned, Brentford have got their new stadium and you really haven't had a chance to get to know it yet. But that's right. Often when that happens, I mean, most of my Arsenal supporting fans still mourn the loss of Highbury and West Ham fans certainly miss the Bolin ground. Are you at all worried that some of that unique atmosphere will go? I'll tell you something, I was very, very worried. And like I said to you, we, we talked to the club about it a lot. But to be fair to the club again, they allowed us, they said, tell you something, what we want is we want the atmosphere. So they allowed us to facilitate that. Basically, all the fans who stood behind the goal are able to um, assemble in a particular area in the new stadium to in- ensure that the atmosphere remains. So yeah. in the West End, so that's going to be happened. But I was, I was gutted when uh, Griffin Park went. And I was one of those people who was living a lie. I just thought, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. We're going to go back in there. Sure it is. And towards the back end of the season, I was speaking to sort of people at the club saying, we will go back in, won't they? They're like, oh, I'm not sure. So yeah, we will, honestly. So I was gutted when that Griffin Park, because it's such a unique stadium. You know, it's old, it's inverted commas, rickety, but it was our stadium. And we were worried that when we move, it's going to be new and shiny and there's going to be a load of corporates coming in and we're going to lose the atmosphere. But when I went 
went to the game. I went to a couple of games. I went to the Bournemouth game when we beat them in the, in, in, in the playoff semi-final. And we were 4,000 there. I'm not being funny, mate. It sounded like there was 50,000 people in the place. We were rocking that place down. So I'm much more comfortable now that the new Brentford, new Griffin Park is going to be all right. OK, that's a building you like. What's a building you don't like? Oh, right. I'll tell you something. Listen, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be churlish and I'm not going to say keep yards locked us row. Because it's a fantastic <laughs> stadium. <laughs> because listen, it's the, the Kyan Prince Stadium, the fact that they, they named it after Kyan Prince, I've got, I've got a lot of respect for QPR for that as well. And again, I'm not going to say Craven Cottage, which I should do bees up, pull them down, because I actually got a lot of respect for that, that stadium. I think it's a wicked stadium as well. I'm actually going to flip it around and I'm going to go somewhere which is fairly local to me because I've actually moved up to North London and the Arts Depot in North Finchley is, is horrendous, right? It's absolutely horrendous. That brilliant opportunity to bring sort of a local community piece to the area. Okay, apparently it's, it's opened in 2004 as an award-winning arts centre. I don't know what awards they were winning, but you know they didn't win any awards in my book for the enjoyment and the development of the arts in the North London area. It used to be the old Gormont Cinema back in the day, and they just basically just lumped this concrete bit, put a bus station underneath it, and it's not the place that you want to go like, you know, like a tricycle. Each, you know, I love the tricycle. Each the to their oil. own. I guess there's going to be some people who love it, but it's not for you. Let's move on to the best view in London. And if it, is, if it isn't from South Africa Road, where is it? No, it's, so it's te- see, tell you what it is, is sometimes I've got a, my, my, son's, my, my son's autistic right. and uh, great high functioning autism. autism. He, was at, he was at home for two years where I sort of stayed with him for two, for two years um, at that home. I've, I've actually written a chapter for a book called Dad, which you should definitely check out. You know, We Are Dad is, is the hashtag on that one. And I talk about that with my son and my daughter. And, and sometimes because he was at home for two years, he used to get really frustrated. So what I do is I jump on the tube, jump on the train, go through the Docklands, all the way down to Greenwich, yeah. okay, or we'll get on a boat to Greenwich, and then from Greenwich we walk up and we'll go walk all the way up to the observatory, and then we'll go down to the observatory and we sit down and we'll just look over the observatory and look over the river to the other side. And that just really calmed him down because he used to get a lot of frustration. And so for me, having to sit cooped up in your house with your son like that, and all of a sudden going out on that trip and sitting down there and chilling, you know, completely chilling out, I used to love just taking that trip, taking an hour and a half to get there, sitting on top of that hill for a couple of hours. It's the best view in London, I think. I agree with you. It is wicked. Up by the Statue of Wolf, up where the, uh, the observatory is, looking down across the river is just majestic. It is fantastic. I tell you, I love it. I love it. South East London as well. I don't didn't know it that much, but I've, I've, I've started to sort of discover a little bit more. I popped down to Dulwich Hamlet quite a lot as well, as, as the Dulwich Hamlet fans know me as I go down there as well. I'm starting to feel a little bit of love for South East London, where I didn't really know that area before. What's your favourite open space? A park, a garden, whatever you choose? Tell you something... I thought Richmond Park was back in the day when I used to live in West London, used to go there a lot with the deer, picnics and stuff like that. We've talked about the Greenwich Park view over there as well. But actually, I was thinking about this. At the moment, what actually gives me a little bit of a buzz, I mean, I've actually taken up football coaching. So during the pandemic, I started taking up football coaching. I started coaching a a, a girls team, an under-12 girls team called Barnet Nightingales, which is a a great little team as well. We've got quite a few teams. And we're looking out for new players as well, if anyone's interested in coming down. But anyway, I'm coaching this team, which is a great team. And they actually play at a cricket ground ground called the Walkers Cricket Ground in... It, it's called the Walkers Cricket Ground in Finchley. Right. And it's just a lovely area, a lovely pitch, a lovely... And we go down there every other Saturday where we play our home games. And it just makes me feel really good when I go there. So Walkers Cricket Ground in Southgate, they do fireworks there on fireworks day as well. It's kind of my new home open space on Saturday to get the girls to play their football, the Barnet Nightingales girls. And I, I love it. That's that's a new one on me. I think it's the first time anyone's ever picked that. So I'm, hey. I must go... I've never been there. I must go and investigate. Left field. Are you a shopper? <laughs> what What would you pick as your your most interesting shop? Tell you something. Can I Can I go old school? On yeah, the of course front? you can. Tell you something. Right. I used to. I, again, <laughs> there's a lot of things that people don't know about me. But I used to play. I, I used to play the piano from the age of five, and I actually went to the Royal College of Music. Did okay, you? which is just yeah, yeah. I went to the Royal College of Music, which is behind the um, the Royal Albert Hall. And I used yeah. to go there to the Saturday school. Right. Sort of quite you know quite high standard of musician and everything like that. And I actually really hated it because I was going from a stage where I was going from a clubbing stage, going out, and I was like a little rude boy from, you know, from 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 Isleworth is where I lived, little rude boy. So I turned up in my Crombie at Royal College of Music, and they all, they go, God, what's he wearing? That's, that's disgraceful, is she wearing that? And I used to sort of play all my scar songs instead of playing the classical records. Anyway, I used to always shoot off after, instead of, I used to, if there was a break, I used to always walk down to Kensington Market. 
And I used to walk down to Kensington Market and go downstairs. And there's obviously, if you walk from, from the Royal Albert Hall to Kensington Market, not the right-hand side one, which was the posh market, but the left-hand side one, go downstairs. And I used to hang out in Gaz Mail. So Gaz, well, right. Gaz is Rocky Gaz's Blues. Gaz is Blues, yeah. That's right. He had a little shop down there. And I used to always go down there and ch- chat to him about, you know, every week about, I just used to love his little shop. He used to tell me what was coming on. You know, I'd say to him, you know, the specials are coming out. He, he told me about a new band. I've got a new band. A friend of mine's in it. They're called the Body Snatchers. Oh, really, Gas? What's that all about? So we just sit down and every week we would talk about stuff. And you know, I didn't have much money, so I don't think I've, I bought very much from him. I probably bought sort of a, a button-down shirt or a couple of couple of badges or something like that from him. But I used to just love going out to Gaz's shop in Kensington Market. It was fantastic. Really, really good bloke. And I used to go to Gaz's Rocking Blues afterwards and sort of see him, seen him all around, but um, he's John Mayall's son, as you probably yeah, know, the no, blues. Yeah. And he's a great yeah. scar kind of fanatic that's, as well. That's well, that's the whole thing. He's a scar that his shop was a he was like a rude boy shop, so you can buy all the tonic suits, you know, the salts, the clears, the, the braces. I had I think he had records as well, so you got a bit, bit of vinyl. And like I said to you, for me, just spending hours inside there instead of going to my piano lesson and my trombone <laughs> lesson, and me, I used to like doing percussion, I did percussion there as well at the, at the Royal College, so I didn't mind doing that. So I went back for my percussion lesson, but the other ones I wasn't really feeling at the time. But Gaz rescued me for all that and I loved I loved hanging out with him okay let's go to a pub bar or a restaurant where would you take us oh is it going to be one of the pubs on the corner of the old Brentford ground or? it's not listen the, the, you know listen the Griffin is the one that everyone knows and I love that little pub as well but I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm I, I talked about Yum Yums which is in Stoke Newington which I yeah. love you've got to check it out you must know it as well Atik is the guy that runs it so when I lived in Stokey like I said you know everywhere you used to do all these parties and you, you used to let us run parties and his dad is actually they call him the sort of the he's the East London um, Tom Moore as well the, he's a hundred year old who did a lot of walking in East London that's actually his dad actually runs um, Yum Yum so we've had great parties there as well but also in the East End because you remember back in the day the East End was good because you could go to parties there and because no one lived there you could do lock-ins like all nighters. So we used to actually go to Vic Naylor's, right. um, which was, uh, which is, yeah, Peter used to run that as well. I think he's married to Janet Street Porter now. And he just lock us in two, three o'clock in the morning. It was actually the pub in Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. So I'm a bit confused, Billy. Which pub have you chosen or restaurant? Right, I'm actually, actually going to go for, I'm actually, I'll tell you what, I'm actually going to go for the Globe, which is the pub that you've come to in Brentford, which is our pub. Yeah. It's a friendly pub. The, the owner's brilliant. And I just love the Globe. And any fans that want to come down, they'll have a really, really good time there. So a great football pub and the owner Paul and Callum are fantastic and they'll just they'll do anything for you I can vouch for that um, okay pick one memorable night out could be a night out clubbing could be a night watching football whatever you fancy um, okay I'm going to do again I've talked about Africa Centre before with Soul to Soul which is great you know I've, I've, from Hammersmith I used to go to the Hammersmith Palais with Selector and Madness and Bad manners and the beat, but that was that building was really great. But what I'm actually going to go back to, and this a sort of slightly cheating here, is we used to go to Dingwalls, right? Yeah. Which for me was fantastic. And you know, Giles Peterson's talking loud on a Sunday. It was actually a Sunday afternoon, but you could call that a night because one of the time it went there, it was all dark. We actually used to go to Brentford. Used to play on a sun a Sunday morning. 11 o'clock kickoffs. So I used to go down there with my, my Sussex posse because I, I used to live in Sussex. So Toby, Tom, all that lot. Um, Steve, Steve Toussaint, who is actually the actor who is in uh, Small Axe as well. All us lot used to go down there. Ike used to go to Brentford, 11 o'clock, finishes at 1 o'clock, get on the train, get out to being Dingwalls. Dingwalls 2 till 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock, whenever it was with Giles Peterson, uh, talking loud night. And for me, that was that was it. I mean, if I had only two pounds to pay on the guest list for that week, I would save me two pounds to go down to Dingwalls on a Sunday afternoon for this Giles Peterson talking loud night because it was for me. That was that was me. That was just hundred percent, and I loved it. It was a great night. I went there many times myself, and I can only concur. Okay, I'm going to give you a day off, Billy. How would you spend it? <laughs> The thing is, right, I work for myself, so it's a bit of a hard one, like, you know what I'm saying? So, for, so uh, it, it, my whole time is spent working, my brain's working the whole time. Not, and, not you this know, day, it's not, you're having a day off. No, that's what I'm saying. So, it's really, bought, you know, do podcasting, do producing stuff for, you know, sports TV and all that stuff, but I just think, actually, tell you what, my day's off, what I actually do is I just speak out my friends and actually go and see them during the week. So, it might be doing the things that other people don't want to do, I'll go into London. You know, and I'll see my friends, you know, normally during the weekday as opposed to weekend because I don't actually normally get a chance to see them because I work out at home or I work wherever I plan to do. So it's a bit of a boring shot, but I actually love going to just to see my mates, going out to a pub, going out for a bit of lunch um, on my time off because um, especially during the pandemic times, you need to see people more and actually sort of realise how valuable they are. 
so just kind of mooching with your mates, basically, on a day off. That's right. That's right. Into town. Um, you know, we spoke earlier on about your kind of anti-racist activities and you've been very much involved in that in football. You know, and as you said, you are yourself a, a, a black British football fan and a black English football fan as well, following England yeah. games. Has it yeah. got better? Because I stopped, I must admit, Billy, probably 20 years ago, maybe even more, I stopped going to England games, which I yeah. used to go because of the racism. I hated it. Um, and and I, I just, you know, and obviously I wasn't in the same position as you. Has it no. got better? Uh, I mean, I've been to, and, and again, it's not a boast, but it, it's just to put things in context. I've been to six European championships, seven World Cups and one Women's World Cup as well. I love England as a football team because I, I believe in that you support the team that, you know, where you, where you come from, where you're born. You know, you come, I support Brentford because I was born like mile down the road. And as far as I'm concerned, like, when I go to England, I must admit, I actually haven't heard... I've never had major, major grief. And any time I've got any grief, I've always fronted it up. Yeah. It was much worse in the 90s. Yeah, it actually and that's when changed. I stopped going, to be honest. Yeah, it changed in 2002 for the Japan World Cup, which was a fantastic World Cup that will never, ever, ever be beaten. And, it's, and, it, and of course, it's getting better. I think what's happened now, though, the truth is, social media has opened things up. So all of a sudden, there's a people uh, who are too afraid to say something to, you, to your face. They won't say it. You know, so they'll put it on social media and also we'll open it up so you can have one person who may be based wherever put something on social media and there's big uproar. But interestingly, if you actually sort of say things to people's faces, they're quite scared. So for me, I haven't got a problem. Like last last night, I turned around to the guy and I said, you're making me feel uncomfortable. And he was like, oh, yeah, but everyone's doing it. I said, that's not the point. I'm a black England fan and you're making me feel uncomfortable. And all of a sudden you see that he got sheepish and everyone around him starts saying, yeah, that's out of order. And I think what you need is that you do need like a mobilisation of people to think, actually, I feel stronger to actually talk out about, against this because normally they're the ones that are shouting really loud and I'm really worried that I might get hurt. But I think that if you can actually mobilise the silent majority, as I call them, things may change a lot because there are a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of very positive people. And after the, the booing session, I went out in Borough last night and I, I had the best night. I missed the best people, some great England fans out there, some really, really good people. And the problem is that some of these idiots, they tar the brush of too many people. And that's what I keep saying when I go to all my World Cups and European Championships. I meet brilliant people. Don't let them not tar it. Get, get you, you know, you, you must see, and I, and I show with my video blogs, I do anything like that. I try and show a different side of the world and of football fans. And I try to make it positive, but I don't white, you know, whitewash what they do as well. I say that still happens. Does that make sense? It does indeed. Let's, t let's find out where you would take someone who's never been here before. Uh, I've got, I've tell you something. I've got to say it's going to be new Griffin Park. It's going to be our new stadium. It's got, it's got to be. And I'm not, I was trying to sort of kind of think of the theater and I, was, and I thought, nah, listen, that's nonsense. If anyone's going to come down to listen, we can do all that as well. We could take him on a boat around the river, but I've got to take him down to Brentford's new stadium because I'm proud of it. I'm proud of what we do. And I'll take him to the pubs beforehand. I'll take him to the globe beforehand. I'll take him to the new stadium to meet all the, the to see the team, meet all the characters and just get the vibe because I'm actually very, very proud of what Brentford and what it's about. And you can hear the way I talk about it with excitement. So I want to sort of kind of instill that into somebody else for them to see because you know if, if they're from america they would have seen you know man united and chelsea and arsenal on tv nothing wrong with those teams they're all cool but i want them to see a slightly different side to football which is probably slightly different quirky which they won't get well, over there so hopefully I'll, I'll, that's where it'll be i'll get to go there when we play you again soon for whatever reason <laughs> yeah, yes well maybe four or five years maybe yeah i'll be seeing you then robert is it no we're getting promoted <laughs> next season um, of course what's the worst journey you've ever had to make billy um, London is, you know, and you've probably had so many people saying the traffic, the hangar lane, the, the, the Tottenham A406. But I just thought back to this. I'll tell you something. One that really, really annoyed me is that I was actually on my way to Heathrow. I was going to Japan for, um, I was going for, for a gig with, 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 with one of my artists as well. And he was out, out, out in Japan. And, uh, and I'd also arranged with my mates out there. I had a whole load of, because I love going to football wherever I go. So I was going to all these matches in Japan that I'd lined up. I think I was going to sort of, I can't remember. It was, I can't remember who was playing as I sort of, uh, Tokyo Verde or something like that. Anyway, so, so I got on the train, uh, North London, it's a tube. And I got my head in the headphones and I was just looking down. And I didn't realise because I was in plenty of time. And all of a sudden I looked up and I thought, Jesus Christ, we were only at sort of Hammersmith. And it was like, you know, and time it ticked away. So basically, this journey took about sort of three hours to get from North London to Heathrow. What happened? And I legged it. And by the time I got there, got into the, got to the, got to the, got to the, and they went, sorry, 
you're done. And they just put the thing down. So it's actually the, oh, only no. the second plane I've ever missed. I missed the plane going to World Cup 90 once um, in, in Italy. To, 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 um, to, I was going to Turin and I missed the plane going to Turin for World Cup 90. It's a nightmare. But this is the second plane I ever missed. So I missed the football match. I missed seeing my mates. I had to pay some extra money. They put me on a flight, I think, the following day. And so I, moved, I went back home, actually. I said to me, she goes, what are you doing? I said, oh, God, I've just missed the flight. She goes, I can't believe it. You left ages ago. I said, fancy going to Notts County. And I threw the kids <laughs> in the car. <laughs> and we drove up to Notts County to see Brentford play in Notts County instead of going to Tokyo. So that was, uh, yeah, it kind of made up for it. I think we won as well. Brilliant. Um, who are you going to pick? What are you going to pick as your personal London landmark? Uh, again, I can't. I can't run around this. It's got to be uh, Griffin Park, the original Griffin Park. What's going to happen me, to it? Does it get knocked down and redeveloped? It's getting knocked down. Or? Yeah, I'm not. Again, it's on social media, and I can't watch it, so I haven't watched any of the clips. But the, the, the bulldozers have come in, and they're knocking them down. And I know people used to sing it. You know, you, you're building flats on the cottage, but they're, they're definitely building flats on Griffin Park at the moment now. And it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a it, it tears to my eye for that one because it's such a great place. But it's one of those things that's got to happen. But it was for me, it was iconic, and all my friends. Whatever team they support, they all go, oh, we love Griffin Park. So for me, that is the one that sort of stands out for me. I never loved Griffin Park. We always lost. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. And that's except, why I love it even more. <laughs> I, said, I loved it when Mark Bertram scored in the last minute. I enjoyed that oh, one, though, Ian. Oh, good. And he had bird, what's it on his head, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't say another <laughs> you word. That one? I'm not going to say it. I know about it. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favourite fictional Londoner? Who are you going to pick for that? Tell you it's going to be. It's going to be DCI John Luther. Lufa, which is uh, Ildris Elba as well. Brilliant, brilliant. I just love his straightforward, brilliant cop as well. And uh, he used to, um, he used to actually, like, uh, he used to, again, because obviously he likes to flip his music as well. So it does a bit of DJing and stuff. And he, remember he used to come down to Charlie Dark's Blacktronica right. as well when it used to be at the ICA. And I remember my mate Steve, Steve Toussaint as well, kind of standing up there and all of a sudden said, oh, no, Bill, this is uh, Idris. Like, well, at the time, I was like, Idris, oh, what, how are you doing? And he's sort of, sort of standing up there dancing to us to the old Blacktronica night. But um, yeah, Idris Elba, he's a, he's a very, very good actor and a very, very nice bloke as well. It's also, it sort of portrays a London that we hadn't seen before. It's not the tourist London. It's not the glamorous London, is it? It's that it's, sort yeah. of slightly scruffy, slightly seedy, but very recognisable city that we actually live in. Yeah, and that's what I like about kind of my, this is what I, reflects a lot of my whole life. You know, if, if anyone, you know, wanted to say to you, what's your life about? My life is about, was about Clubland. It was about anything that wasn't, you know, wasn't Big Ben and it wasn't sort of kind of like, you, you know, you know this as well. When, when you used to go out, right? I used to go out clubbing every night except for Saturday, Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday I used to stay at home, but I used to go out Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday yeah. because it had a left fieldness to it. And the people that used to go out and you felt at home with them. So for me, I love uh, I love London, but it's almost like the alternative London. I'm a, a British person, but I'm a black British person. But what when we but is as British is my Britishness. It's kind of like the London that I love reflects my Britishness, yeah. and I think this is what's an interesting thing with it's what's the diversity. Yeah. And with that word gets used a lot. But if you live here, you understand it. It means that you we, understand it. We've got it all. It's there for all of us to share and enjoy. And you know, you've been involved in Bangra music. You've been involved in club music. You, you know, you're involved in football. We can do that. That's right. That's right. And that's that's the thing. We can do that. Some people, and this is the interesting thing about being a football fan and going around the country. I'm a a very, very tolerant person. I'll talk to anybody. And even if people don't understand, I'll sit down and have a pint with them and I'll talk to them for half an hour. And they may come around and they say to you, oh, Bill, actually, I've never spoken to a black person before. And I never knew about these views. And I never knew why people get upset about that. And I never knew why people, you might be uncomfortable when, when, you know, when I'm saying I don't like people and they're taking the knee. But when you spent half an hour explaining to me what, you know, that view was about the fact that, you know, something that's been owned by black people for once, you know, and we're going out there proudly doing it. We, the Marxist question is nonsense, that people just use it about politics. That's absolute nonsense. My daughter is 12 years old, and all she knows is something has happened to enable people to come together to, um, to, to, to demonstrate the fact that, you know, somebody at school was uh, was, was victimised by their teacher or used to get bullied at school or, you know, or you never got the job that you were meant to do or you were on the football terraces and got kicked around the place like I did back in the day. All these things have come together for people to go out and say, tell you what, we're demonstrating as a world, as a country against that. What right do you, as a, as a white person, to tell me I can't do that? This is something that I have discovered myself and, there's a, there's a, and it's grown throughout the whole country, throughout the whole world. And you're now trying to tell me, again, 
oh, you can't do it that way. You must do it this way. It's nonsense. It really does my head in, as you, as you, as you, can, as you can hear. I can hear. Let's pick your favourite London film or book or play or whatever you like. Um, well, I'll tell you something. Uh, it's interesting. We're talking about sort of education. My, my kids, I make sure that they're educated on London uh, black history. And yeah. I use films like Babylon, which I love the Babylon Babylon's movie. Babylon's a great so, film. It's a fantastic film. film. We watched that through lockdown with the kids and I explained to them about that, you know, in the end, you know, my daughter, 12 years, she goes, I can't take no more of that. I said, that's <laughs> it. You've got it now, like, you know. But anyone who hasn't seen Babylon, you should check it. It's out on the, I think it's out on Netflix at the moment now. But what I did love at the same time, because you had Babylon, you had Small Axe as well. And yeah. they had Lover's Rock, which was kind of similar to what was happening on, on Babylon as well. You had the, the Mangrove one, which I thought was wicked, which is Darkest um, Dark Howl. Hell which is uh, Darkest Beast, actually, who ran uh, Universal Records, Island Records over here as well, which I've known Darkest for, for years as well. But it was actually his mum and dad, you know, in that as well. So, again, the little music industry link between that. But I thought that was wicked. And also, like I said to you, my mate um, Steve Toussaint is, 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 is in one of the, of the series there. So I, I love that Small Act series because what it did is it actually kind of brought back a lot of conversation about sort of black Britishness within the whole societies and in, within our football whatsapp group we've got a besotted whatsapp group as well and it was on fire people talking about it discussing things some things that they just didn't know which were depicted in that series and i think you know that's actually really really quite important like you know yeah. so for me i thought it was you know, i thought it was a triumph uh yeah. small acts i thought it was brilliant and it it was stories that needed to be told as well i think that's right. And, I've, and this is the whole thing. When we talk about education, OK, what we have to do is that, listen, I understand people have got different points of view, but also people and I'm not using education in a sort of like you must be educated. Like, you know, people use it in a way which people, can turn people off. What I'm saying is that instead of people shouting their mouth up sometime because they have an opinion and they want to put it out there step back three or four steps and try and put yourself into somebody else's shoes and learn. So maybe go and read a few books, go and watch a few of these shows and then think about it. Then you can come back and have a proper discussion because at the moment now, a lot of people don't do that. They're just entrenched in their views and they don't really care. And I think there needs to be a little bit more of kind of, you know, you need to be a little bit more, you know, in, in your approach and just think about it because if you want to start working together and living together with people, you need to start understanding people a little bit more. You've got to understand where they're coming from. And in the book, Dad, like I said to you, which I've wrote the chapter for, we should definitely should check out. I talk a lot about when my parents say, you know, you, you need to know where you're coming from to know where you're going to. And that is very, very, very important as far as I'm concerned. We're going to find out now where you're going to in terms of London's future or past. Which way are you going to go? I'll tell you what, I'm going to go back. And uh, this, this is going to—it's it's a bit of a tricky one for me because, like, my dad came over in the fifties. My mum and dad came over in the fifties, fifty-five, fifty-six. They came over on on boats. My dad actually came over on the Queen Elizabeth. I was—I've I've actually recently tucked into the old ancestry, like you know, what I'm saying, and I've got his, his boating documents and everything like that. And I'm thinking, hold on a minute, dad, you came over on the QE. That's posh. fair enough. <laughs> yeah, it's proper posh, like you know. So he's come over the QE, and they—they uh, they came over in the fifties, sixties. Um, but of course, when they came into London, and again, you got to understand where we're coming from now they've come in happy really really happy west indians i'm so glad to come to the mother country and they got absolute you know, they got they just got it you know racism prejudice the full monty couldn't get on jobs couldn't find houses how are you meant to feel when you come into a country you know where people are making you feel like this because you color your sin and you're thinking it's not even in their minds when they come here you know so you've got this through years and then this is in so for me I would actually quite like to go back to the sort of to the 60s to try and see what it was like because I know it was bad even in the 70s. I remember the 70s, and the 80s. That was bad, but I'd like to see what it was like. So the West Indians came over, they moved into their own communities because they felt safer. So they'll go to the Brixtons, you go to your elaborate groves, and they're safer in their numbers. You used to have the little parties, you know. I, mean, I love this scar music, so I'd really? love to, you know, in my rude boy gear, dress up, you know, in my rude boy gear, go down to one of these little scar parties, these rude boy parties with, you know, um, black people and also like minded white people who are who used to come in with them as well and just have conversations with them i'd billy, love to be there billy grant you know? you're there and you've been here and you've been a fantastic listed londoner billy to be have you enjoyed it listen i've absolutely loved this mate tell you something and i've loved listen keep me off and but i've got no problems with it i've not got problems with you i've got loads of qpr mates <laughs> like you, you do you know and fulham is different actually now it's cool <laughs> <laughs> billy, let's leave it there we gotta go lovely to speak to you mate <laughs> Weekday mornings with Robert Elms. BBC.
Radio London. Lots of people saying how much they enjoyed our listed Londoner today. Billy Grant, Billy the Bee, um, a kind of football activist, football fan, music biz entrepreneur, and Carney Talk. And it was great as well. I absolutely loved it. And I love the fact that you can be a football fan, you can love your own club, you can have kind of rivalry with other teams. But in the end, we're all Londoners, we're all human beings, we're all certainly he's decent and I am a mo- and the vast majority of football fans are as well so there you go what a terrific listed Londoner Billy Grant was so I want to say thanks to Robert Elms and Radio London for, for doing that little slot I really enjoyed that actually as well and if you want to sort of check out anything else that I've done actually a lot of the stuff that I talk about is written in this book called Dad I've written a chapter in the book Dad and you can catch it on wearedad.co.uk as well the hashtag is we are dad lots of stories from the old school about music about football about my kids about football coaching just lots of stuff mishmashed i said i've done a chapter called from music management to football management uh me and my daughter and how to help her with gender inequality is and it's just interesting just check that out on wearedad.co.uk and also check out all our besotted stuff all our brentford stuff all our upbeat stuff that we do on pride of west dot london thanks for listening